Welcome to Outraging Optimism. I'm Tom Rivett Karnak. I'm Cristiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we ask whether it is time to stop subsidising our own destruction. We speak to Erica Moynez, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama. And we have music from Gander Boys. Thanks for being here. we're going to bring you some interesting analysis of a report that came out that suggested that the world right now is doing the polar opposite of what we requested and suggested last week with Yuval Harari. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But just before we do, Christiana, I know you're very close to the team involved in the Earthshot Prize. And just this week, uh, in fact, yesterday, for those listeners who are listening to this podcast on the day it comes out, there was some very interesting analysis released that shows how they are thinking about the Earthshot Prize this year. Do you want to just give us a quick overview of what that was? Well, the exciting thing about this report that uh, is appearing or has already appeared on www.earthshotprize.org Roadmap to Regeneration is the name of the report. Mm. And um, strictly speaking, the report has been commissioned in order to establish what the priority areas for the Earthshot Prize for this year are going to be across all of the five areas that the um, Earthshot Prize actually works in, which is nature, air, oceans, waste, and climate change. However, from the point of view of those who are not specifically involved in the prize, this report is a really, really interesting piece because what it does is it identifies in each of those global components of our crisis that we're in, it identifies the top three areas that would actually have us reach positive tipping points. So for everyone who's asking like, well, what can I do to have the most impact on oceans or on waste or climate or air or nature? Here is a really, really interesting way, a fast way to say, okay, if you're interested in oceans, here are the three things that you could associate your efforts and your brains with um, in order to have the most impact. Same thing goes for investors. Many times, you know, impact investors are saying, okay, I, you know, I have a, a mandate from my asset owners to look for investment opportunities that are going to have high impact. What are the highest impact areas? across any of those five topics, here is a really quick way of, of seeing that. So a very exciting report that really points toward, um, toward the capacity that we have all to regenerate all of these five um, ecosystems or all of these five components of the global challenge and be able to get us to where we need to be by 2030. Let's remember, the clock is ticking. And can you just remind us of that URL again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, where the- yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm sure if you just type into Miss Google, who knows absolutely everything, Roadmap to Regeneration, she will bring it up for you. But if you want to go to the URL, it's earthshotprize.org and then slash Roadmap to Regeneration. But just Roadmap to Regeneration, will get it. I gotcha, yeah, I gotcha. It's the first time I've heard someone say WWW for a while. I like that. That's what I was about. That's what WWW. <laughs> there you go. Because not a lot of people know this, but World Wide Web is one of the very few examples where the acronym WWW has far more syllables than the words World Wide Web. <laughs> so don't say the acronym, just say World Wide Web. So there you go. Now look, on this Earthshot <laughs> Prize... Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I read that report, right? It's helpful, I'm here, right? You're going to help you navigate your life. But um, I read that report and I thought it was just absolutely a perfect example of what I'm going to call um, a kind of political manifesto unconnected to any party or any ideology. It's like the politics of human survival, which I think is a great unifying force. And mm. it seems to me like this is a kind of a foundational politics, you know, that everything else is built on, that we can really unify around. So that was just a huge endorsement of that brilliant report. 
Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's so exciting to see how it's going to go for this year. One thing that really struck me is it's always so difficult when you're putting these kind of methodologies together for how you look at the world to both capture sort of like solutions that are moving along and scaling up as well as the kind of wild card solutions that could be completely transformative. And I think they've developed a methodology that really encapsulates both. I particularly love the phrase that they're looking for magical, disruptive, wild card solutions. So mm-hmm. anyone out there with any of those, definitely check out the Earthshot Prize. This is going to be a big year for it. Wait, that that re- deserves repeating. Magical, wild card. Magical, disruptive, wild card solutions. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad for your Not a bad description uh, of Christiana Figueres. <laughs> task for tomorrow morning. That's what at we're looking for. Exactly. <laughs> now, um, last week, listeners will remember we had the brilliant Yuval Noah Harari on the podcast, and he talked about many things, but principally about this campaign that he has created to get 2% of global GDP directed towards the solutions to the climate and nature crises. And the day that that podcast came out, Another, da, 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 da. Yeah, another report that came out um, <laughs> that demonstrated that right now we are actually spending 2% of GDP on environmentally harmful subsidies that are heading us in the wrong direction. Financing... 180 degrees opposite to yeah, what you want to say. And 1.8 trillion US dollars, 1.3 uh, trillion British pounds. Um, it's nervous <laughs> laughter, it's nervous laughter. Financing the annihilation of wildlife, uh, supporting destruction of rainforests. Um, just a little bit of detail, 640 billion of financial support for the fossil fuel industry, 520 billion for agriculture and 350 billion for unsustainable use of fresh water. And there's lots of examples in this report around how that money is actually being utilized to accelerate this terrible path that we're on. So I would invite both of you, what, what did you take from this report when you had a look at it before this conversation? Paul, you, you always go first, Paul. Okay, well, look, I, you know, what can we say? This is um, pretty significant. Um, I've been fascinated increasingly with the idea that government isn't super significant in terms of taxation and regulation, but this issue of subsidies and the amount of money going through governments is absolutely critical. I looked it up, actually, before the call today, before our conversation. Um, the OECD point out that, for example, of the GDP of France, 55% is government spending, 50% of the GDP in Germany, 40% of the GDP in the UK, 38% in the US. So if you think about it, kind of give or take, about half the entire economy is the government, uh, or a little bit less. And so it's clearly an enormously significant economic opportunity, actually. And it turns out that at the very moment when people like Yuval are saying we need to put 2% into uh, finding the solutions, and that's quite an achievable political project, we should notice that historically uh, 2% has been kind of carved out by powerful commercial interests uh, and and is in many regards being deployed in 100%, 180 degrees, the opposite direction to the one we want. So I think it's worth us just reflecting a little bit upon the fact that in, in a sense, government is uh, a contested space and very very powerful forces do try to make use of the government for for things that are that are potentially quite damaging and that's something that uh, is another political project we have to focus on so um as as all of you know i I still haven't graduated from kindergarten and every every thought that I have has a little picture associated with it. Pictures are good. So here's, here, here's my little picture about this, okay? We're standing on the shore and there's this huge wind that comes from the back and we, we get in a tiny weensy little sailboat and this very forceful wind just goes and takes the sailboat way off into the ocean. Um, now, if you're a very good sailor and you know how to tack and your uh, sail is large enough, you can probably manage this. But it does seem like these subsidies are just taking us to the uh, off into the ocean without any positive consequence whatsoever. And just turning the direction 180 degrees would bring us back to safe shores. Now, the amazing thing about this is the money is already allocated by governments, right? So that 2% that Jubal was talking about and that Nick Stern has been talking about for decades is not fresh money because we keep on thinking, as Jubal reminded us, as though this were 
new funds that have to be come up yep. with or have to yep. be printed or something. No, it's already there in budget. It's already allocated. And the question is, can we turn it around? And instead of investing it into our destruction, common destruction, can we invest it into our common regeneration? Now, here is a um, naughty little thought that I would love your reaction on. <laughs> what if those subsidies were given to the same industries that are receiving them now, but with a different terms of reference, with a different mandate. What if the subsidies still went to the fossil fuel industry to say, turn off the faucet, no more digging, no more drilling, no more supply of fossil fuels. You get the subsidies, but for a 180 degree different product. Com turn the wind completely around. What if those subsidies still went to the agriculture industry, but with a different mandate? You can continue to be, you know, a, uh, a, a productive and profitable agricultural sector, but with sustainable agricultural practices. What do you think that would work? It's the same money. It's the same industries. We're not killing any industries. We're just giving them a different mandate. Yeah. No, I, I think it's I think it's this is exactly the kind of thinking that we need to actually break through and do things in a different way, right? I that's clearly would be politically very challenging for many friends of ours who would resist that because how dare we in a world yep. that is now accelerating inequality, moving down a path of subsidizing those who already have a lot. So that would make it politically difficult. But I think we need to also use the lens of would it actually solve many of the challenges that we're facing. I mean, I think those subsidies are there for political and for development reasons. And the development reasons are insane because you're continuing to finance your own destruction. You're not helping the development of the people you're trying to help. The political reasons, you know, maybe close to corruption in some cases. And in other cases, there's other structural reasons. But the other challenge that may be there with what you just said, Christiana, is my understanding of those subsidies is some of it is cash but other elements are tax breaks on revenue that you would generate to do a particular thing. So if you look for fossil fuels, you can write off certain elements of your profits as a result of taking the risk on that capital. Now, if you're not doing that and you're not generating revenue, where does the cash come from to provide the subsidy? But nevertheless, I think it's an interesting thought experiment. Well, it's a naughty thought and yeah. and, and definitely, you know, will... Will... Um provoke many rotten tomatoes being thrown at us. But um Paul's staying quiet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Yikes. I hate tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes. Tomatoes and tomatoes. <laughs> it's a naughty thought and will provoke many rotten tomatoes, tomatoes, whatever, being thrown at us. But here's the question. Many of those subsidies are actually very, very old. They have been there for years. Mm. And they have perhaps, perhaps, a justifiable uh, existence historically, because they were put in place when governments really wanted to make sure that we did have an agricultural industry that was being uh, profitable and, and feeding everyone or an energy industry um, that needed to accelerate, et cetera, et cetera. So for historical reasons, they were put there to buttress these industries. Now, the context in which those subsidies are still being granted has radically transformed. And so I'm wondering the purpose of putting those subsidies in, the principle still stands, which is we now need an agricultural system, an energy system that meets the needs of the moment, just like we did historically. It's just that the needs now are very, very different. So can we therefore change the terms of reference of those subsidies for the needs that we have now? And yes, there will be many who don't agree with that. But let's remember that that money is already being dispersed and could be dispersed to change the direction of the winds that could bring us to shore. Uh, and just to, just to build on that, Christiana, you're absolutely right that as ever. Uh, and you know, financiers are very clever. It's true that you know you might be writing off oil and gas expenditure at risk, uh, you know, with tax breaks. 
But you could write off, you know, renewable energy investment risks with tax breaks or different sorts of agricultural products. You know, the financial products can be created. If, if government's taking the risk or if it's providing tax incentives, then you can change behavior. But you do need the political will. And I'm going to just point out that we do live in a little bit of a bubble sometimes. We think that, Always. you know... Always. Um, I, I just uh, I spent a little time uh, looking at uh, the leading presenter uh, on Fox News, Tucker Carlson, who some people say is a presidential candidate. He had a physicist on uh, just uh, a week or two ago who said climate change is a farce created by the media and the politicians it benefits. And he said that the warmest temperatures have not gone up in the last 60 years. So that's going out on the media to millions of people Fox received 2.9 billion income last year, about a billion from advertisers. You know, we've got to recognize that probably when we go out and buy a whole bunch of products ourselves, we're funding climate disinformation that's going out on mainstream media right now. So we still haven't won that ideological debate. And the reason I mention that, not ideological debate, we still haven't won the, the sort of the debate in the public forum to the point that you know, we have, for example, with uh, principles like equality or opposing smoking cigarettes. And the reason I mention that is because we need to have that absolute consensus to drive through these slightly innovative uh, policies that you're talking about, Christiana. Hmm. Great conversation. Um, we are going to have to move now to our interview, uh, unless either of you have anything to add, particularly before we go. All good. We'll be, we'll be back afterwards. Now, Erica Moines is the Panamanian Minister of Foreign Affairs, completely brilliant woman. And Christiana, you know her. I think it would be appropriate for you to do a bit of an introduction. Well, thank you. I um, I have yet to meet her personally, but uh, I have had a few conversations with... That's no Erica. barrier to becoming good friends, we've learned, in the days of COVID. We yeah. love video communication. Yeah. This is true <laughs> in the days of COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Erika Muines um, is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama since uh, 2020. Uh, she is in her middle 40s, so a very brilliant, young, rising political star, uh, not just in Panama, but one could say probably a leading politician in Latin America coming up, educated first in Panama and then at the University of California, Berkeley, as a lawyer. She worked first um, outside of Panama in, uh, in New York and a couple of other cities in large law firms doing project finance, doing mostly financial legal uh, work at, um, at financial institutions. Then in 2004, she returned to Panama to be chief of staff of the Ministry of Commerce and Industries and then moved over to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2019 as vice minister and was then named 2020 as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Very likely the youngest ever uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama. Uh, what I really love about Erica is that she is what I would call um, a shining example of a new generation of political leaders who realize that multilateralism in the 21st century has got to become increasingly green, which means mm. environmental issues are in this century, and especially in this decade, very quickly, rising to be as important as other geopolitical issues that have been either collaborative or confrontational over the past few decades. And so in the international affairs of states, you can no longer separate environmental issues from everything else that needs to be in the conversation uh, between states that is so complex. And she, despite the fact that she's a trained lawyer and her comfort zone is finance, you will note from our conversation with her that she is quite fluent in environmental issues, self-studied, uh, and, and, and quite delightful that she has done so. So let's listen to this conversation with um, this brilliant young foreign affairs minister. Please do remember as you listen to the conversation, she's a foreign affairs minister, not an environment minister. Let's do it. Yeah. 
Minister Erika Muines, thank you very much for taking the time to join us here on Outrage and Optimism. You and I had the opportunity of being on the phone with each other a couple of months ago, and when I had the pleasure of meeting you then, I immediately invited you to the podcast because I think uh, the listeners here will be so thrilled uh, to, to listen to so many innovative uh, things that Panama is doing with respect to climate change, and we'll get into that, but also to hear from such an enlightened foreign minister, because I have to say how delighted I am when I read the news that um, Panama has decided to impose a fee on uh, the ships that go through the fantastic uh, Panama Canal. And the fee is based actually on their greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the reason that I would love for you to talk about this is there's a certain irony, isn't there, that Panama, I think, continues to be uh, the largest registry of ships in the world, having the largest shipping fleet. And so I would love to hear from you, how did you come to that decision? of charging that fee? And when does it go into effect? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's, let's um, for a minute, and I think you mentioned several of what we're known for uh, that puts us in a leadership role, but that it's also a responsibility. So one, we have one of the main waterways of the world. Two, we do, and we still do, have the largest ship registry in the world. And three, we're surrounded by water. We have the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So that leadership, that natural leadership also entails a responsibility and a responsibility that if carried out effectively, you can truly make a change. And it starts by uh, what we're known for and that's the Panama Canal. And yes, some Panamanian uh, or that the flag of the ship is Panamanian will be affected as many others, but it's just the chips right now are, if you combine them, um, they are the eighth emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. So there is a, a, a huge focus at the moment and what we do about the chipping industry to turn it into a more greener and more eco-friendly, understanding the damage that they're doing and right now and how we can, how we can transition effectively. Um, and there are many things that you can do. One, uh, transitioning the fuels that they, that they use. And the second, making sure that the incentives are there. And that incentive or this incentive is what Panama has taken up as uh, establishing uh, this new tariff system that we recently um, announced and will be in effect next year. We are right now in discussions with all the shipping and not all of them are super happy about it, but it is <laughs> what it is. And uh, it will happen um, regardless of the pushback that I think we, we are receiving. Um, it is the right incentives. So it's been structured and there are several elements, how you structure, what is the fuel that you're using, how much is the reduction that you're proposing to, to to, to make up for what that tariff will be for you. So there's a three elements. And um, I, I think it's just one of the many areas that we are, I think we're right now very ocean focused. Uh, we recently, just last year, enacted the protection of literally the equivalent of the size of our country is right now protected in oceans. We were the first after um, uh, we announced now Costa Rica, Colombia, and Ecuador are, are will be joining um, in that protection. And I, I think it's just, uh, there's so much that we can do in the oceans and every little thing that we do has a significant impact in what we're trying to do in terms of protecting the planet. Well, um, was there, I can understand perfectly well that there was pushback from the owners of the ships abroad who have to use. What, what was the dynamic inside? Was it immediately taken on or were there some sectors that were concerned about this? So we've been talking about it for a while, but it just happened to coincide with the pandemic and the changes and the dynamic uh, in terms of world trade and shipping because of the pandemic itself. So I think the nature of what we're going through has slowed down the implementation, but it will happen regardless of, you know, uh, I think uh, we're all in the, in, 
heading towards economic recovery. So there are no more excuses in terms of when that implementation can take effect. And is there a clear idea already, Minister, of what the resources will be um, will be dedicated to? Well, the Panama Canal has um, a specific allocation, some for the for the operation, and then the other one goes into the government. And we're now currently discussing how much of that budget of the general uh, government it's allocated to protection and uh, restoration. One of the things that I think that are interesting is on the Pacific right now we're establishing what will be the largest scientific station in the Pacific. And here's why it's interesting, because you'll be able to measure what what are you doing that is positive? So, because one thing it's saying I am protecting. So, but what does that mean? Are you regenerating by this much? Or, I mean, are there species that are now starting to regenerate? So, having a station and having a- absolute and specific hard data in terms of what that means for the protection of our oceans and the regeneration of the biomass, which I think will will be key in in convincing other stakeholders on, on taking similar policies. So that um, that's a nice segue, Minister, to another topic that we wanted to invite you uh, to share, which is Panama's status as a carbon negative uh, country, one of only three, Bhutan and Suriname. Carbon negative meaning that Panama absorbs more carbon from the air than it actually emits, than CO2 that it emits. Um, and uh, I, I totally understand that from Bhutan and Suriname, but from Panama, that is a very interesting equation that you have been able there to figure out because Panama definitely has more industry, more transport, more emitting sources than, uh, than Bhutan and Suriname. So how did you figure that out? Is this uh, the result of the equation of how much of Panama's both forests and oceans are uh, are absorbing, or is that the result of only the land the land absorption? How how did you do that, and why is it important for Panama? Yeah, so this is not just for the record, Panama saying we think that we're carbon negative. We actually, so there's a certification process and inventory process. So you you, you create an inventory where you you bring people along, you set up essentially a catalog of how much you're emitting versus how much you're absorbing. And it is mostly focused in land. Um, And we have historic three elements that finally, I think combine and we've been able to sort of get a hold on what's happening in Panama. One, uh, historically, indigenous populations have gotten huge amounts of land as protected areas. And that has, and, and, and this is not just in Panama, there are several countries in the world where thanks to those indigenous populations, they are truly the, the gatekeepers of our forests. So in Panama, um, they've been able because of those protected areas to keep away large uh, developments in, in our forests. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we have a significant amount of renewals in our energy matrix. And number three, the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal meant that we needed to have protected areas to, to maintain the watershed. So the, the, the basin of the Panama Canal in order to have water for the Panama Canal to operate. So those three elements have been able to allow for this inventory of, of, of the carbon that we emit versus the one that, that we absorb to be positive for Panama and for the planet. Now, uh, going back to your point that you understand Bhutan and Suriname. So uh, that's what I find fascinating and that I think it's a story for the world. It doesn't matter what your economy is. So Panama, yes, we are an industry and service-based economy. We're able to get there. Any other country could. It's just a matter of deciding, of protecting your areas and actually committing to it. And I think that in our discussions with both Bhutan and Suriname, not, not even Bhutan and Suriname are also similar in their economies or where they're located. 
So exactly. the three of us are yes. in different places, different economies, different everything, and we are able to get there. So I think it's just a positive story to tell that neither in the three of us will, I will also say, we also we have not received any form of resources from all those wonderful funds that have been created to support and to maintain to keep off the the warming of the planet. So I I think that we share not only the positive, but the frustration as well as not getting those resources that people would assume that you're getting them. And also the challenge, because the fact that we're carbon negative now doesn't say, uh, or there's no guarantee that we'll stay that well. So there's also efforts in order to make sure that those areas keep on being protected and that the protection always is not something you're saying, that there's actual review surveillance in order to make sure uh, that the areas maintain that pristine uh, component. Um, and in order to do that, you need to have the society believe that is good. There's no mm-hmm. way in the world that Bhutan or Panama or anybody could safeguard all their their either their ocean or their their forest you need the people the citizens to say this is good for me because ultimately i benefit from it and understand it because when you have everybody as a gatekeeper uh for for those uh restoration and and reforestation uh, plants it becomes effective otherwise it's just something nice that you say i'm protecting but when you do and you actually do the inventory you you realize well but there's not the forest that I thought it would be here because, um, yeah, it becomes something that we as a country believe that is good for Panama. And what is good for the economy is good for the planet. It's just that change of mentality. People think that it's more costly and sometimes it is. But once you get there, it becomes better for the economy. You create more employment. It's renewal. I mean, I I will go on and on, but it's just uh, hopefully a change of mentality that we need more countries to follow along. Oh, well, but, but, we would I, completely agree with you, but but how did you get there? Yeah, that's yeah, my that question. Paul, I have Paul, to, gonna, s- same how, question. How, you know, you ahead, said Paul. any other country could do it. You said society must believe in it. And we've spent, you know, a couple of years now talking about how so few countries, if any, have managed to do it. So if you can give insight into how you arrived at this incredibly uh, advantageous position, it would be wonderful for our listeners. I, I think that... Um, it is the concept of Panamanians, we've always been sort of prone to trade, right? So it's it's a it's a mercantilist, it's a, it's a trade-based economy where people are thinking, what is good for me? How do I benefit? And to set up campaigns, which we've done in the in the idea of no, you're helping the planet or whatever, you're helping yourself. If you protect that tree in front of you, you are protecting yourself. You're going to get tourists that are going to come. You're going to have uh, the produce of whatever. So to change the mentality and it's education, the education at the end is the key. We are right now working on a new area and we have two components right now for the new area that will be protected. Education, number one. If you're not educating the people that are nearby, then you have riots, you get frustrated, they say, I can't eat enough because I used to fish from, for instance, that sea, and now you're precluding me. So education, including how are they going to make their livelihood if you are precluding them from their normal means, and the second surveillance. Um, Because again, if if you're not uh, making sure that it is happening, then it's just something nice to say, but it's without any results. Hmm. And how is that hmm. surveillance? Is that monitored through satellites? Is that the Panamanian army? How, how, what is the surveillance? We have a lot of satellites now working both. So there are news for the ocean that we will be that will be in place for the new protected areas. And we have also for the forest and for the forest, they've been absolutely key because it is hard again to to have this vast area and without somebody actually monitoring and and you'll see the graphics of somebody coming in and then cutting a tree in the middle of the night and then smuggling wood from that tree. And you cannot prevent that other than by having uh, that technology available connected to the the environmental police that we have that that, that are doing, I think, an incredible job. (laughs) 
Minister Moines, that's amazing. Like, we have a lot of satellites, and this informs the environmental police. I mean, honestly, you're speaking like a, a minister from the 23rd century, if I might say so, not the 22nd century. So uh, really <laughs> huge, huge respect. Um, and may I ask a question a little bit uh, uh Christiana alluded earlier to the fact that that you've been pioneering some thinking about how, uh, as foreign minister, that's also, um, you know, mixed with some of the responsibilities of environment minister. Can you talk us through a little bit of your thinking about how ministerial offices um, perhaps might be reconfigured in the government of the future? Sure. There is a role for governments to play from a foreign policy perspective on everything related to the climate. Because you can do a lot from your country. And I'll speak, you know, Panama is a small country and what we can do is great, but it only gets to a certain extent. Um, the protection of the oceans that I was referring to, the fact that we protected our area, we're a tiny country. Colombia that is next to it is huge compared to us. The fact that now they've joined this idea of protecting the Pacific corridor, as well as Costa Rica and Ecuador, made it amazing. Now we have Galapagos, we have Cocos from Costa Rica. So mixing the foreign policy aspect and make it an also a priority because then you get the support, the political support. These are not easy decisions. Uh, the fishing industries, everybody know that they're very powerful. They move uh, um, uh, strings as much as they, they can or they will in order to get that um, the industrial fishing going on. So having the support from other governments saying, do this, it will be costly, it will be expensive, it will be hard for you, but I've done it, I've gone through, I'm going to support you. Uh, it is also very valuable. And trying to think of this as more, rather than each country, what are they doing separately, but what are we doing as a community, as a region? And there are tons of projects that we all benefit. The, the, I was mentioning, for instance, education. The same education that the Panamanians need on the new protected areas, will be the same that Ecuadorians need or that Costa Ricans need. So these are also interchangeable uh, skill set that, that it is easy also to get finance and to get the cooperation going. So uh, again, that element of coordinating uh, amongst countries, Bhutan, Suriname, and Panama, the three countries, we don't have diplomatic relations with Bhutan, but we were able to talk about this and to form this alliance. So it, it, it is a beautiful aspect that we can connect that should be a priority. And there's so much that we can do together. Well, um, Minister, the listeners of this podcast know that I'm always singing the praises of Costa Rica uh, on so many different <laughs> aspects. But I think after this conversation, we're going to have to substitute Costa Rica and start singing the praises of Panama. You've definitely topped, uh, topped the aspiration here. So congratulations to that. Um, and and before we, we finish, and thank you so much for your time, Minister, just... Um, also would love to hear your sense about the role of women. And you were recently quoted by saying, let me be very clear, by failing women, we also fail the planet. Um, some thoughts about that? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that there was a study um, in 130 countries where whenever you had a decision on climate, if you had a woman that was leading, she was more inclined to sign it than if it was a man. Um, when we went to the COP26, the picture there of the leaders were, I think, 90% men. I don't know if you recall this picture of the leader. To me, that just says where we are. And, and this is what I think we should do. One, we have to be realistic about what's going on and that at the leader ship role, the, 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 the people that are taking the decisions right now are mostly men. That's, a, that's, that's the true picture. Two, we have to be optimists that we can change that and that more and more uh, people are understanding the value of having women at those leadership positions. And three, we all have to be activists. Wherever role we are, whether we are in the private sector or in the public sector, there is a role for you. Women or men, it doesn't matter. You have to be an activist. You believe in this to actually drive change. An activist in women and gender equality, or are you talking about different kind of activism? 
I, I think that we need to be activists and support women taking those leadership roles. It's not easy. It's not easy. It takes time. It takes effort and it takes support from men and women at all levels to have more women at those leadership positions. And see that the ones that are making the laws are not going to make laws that promote gender equality if they're mostly men. Um, same for climate. I mean, there are so many aspects that we need just more women right now. I, I think it's about 20% of worldwide. I mean, if we're 50, 50, why is it that only 20% women are at those leadership positions and political power uh, to drive that change that we all desperately need? Well, and it, and it takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? It takes a lot of courage because we have to break through patterns that are thousands of years old, behavioral patterns, mental patterns um, that have been uh, have been toler- practiced and tolerated for way too long. And when you are courageous enough to begin to question a behavior pattern and say, no, that is not longer acceptable then we do get a lot of criticism from many sides. So it takes a heck of a lot of courage to stand up. It does, but that's why you need the support. So if you do something, having the support of men or women, this is why we all become activists. Wherever you are, there is a role for you to play in your community and in wherever, to speak up and and support and, and try to shed light to what I was saying. So there is this crude reality that we're all facing, particularly coming out of the pandemic, um, for women. Um, but we have to be optimists. We should be optimists. There has been changes. It's, there's just a lot more than we need to happen and in the short time. So that takes us to our final question, um, Minister, and that is we always uh, ask our guests at the end whether uh, with all the challenges that you have ahead of you, uh, both environmental as well as geopolitical, what makes you still outraged that we're not going as quickly as we should? And what makes you optimistic that we actually have a bright future in front of us? Hmm. I, I'm outraged about the lack of political commitment towards the protection of our planet, um, especially the oceans that I was referring to. You hear a lot about commitment and commitment and commitment is all wonderful and compelling speeches that do not translate into anything. There is, there is a lack of accountability right now. And uh, so I, I always say that for every speech, there should be a line where there is accountability. So what it translated to what? Um, but uh, there are actions and, and you have to be, I think, I am optimistic and encouraged because of what we were just talking about. There is an increasing women entering the field, uh, science, and are trying to lead the way. And there is activism. You know, why, why are we talking about this? Politics, academia. So these are voices that are getting louder and louder. And and I will produce that accountability and those long term solutions that we all desperately need. Mm, wow. Thank you. Great. Minister, thank you very much. A very busy day for you. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Uh, my, my respect to you and to your country and all the best, because uh, I think you're right in the middle of quite a few political projects for which you will need uh, much more support. So all the best. We shall be following. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. So, so fantastic to be able to have the Panamanian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Erica Moynez, on this podcast. Uh, that was incredible conversation. I was so sad I was able to join you for it. What did you both leave that discussion with? I, um, I think, you know, referencing our earlier conversation about um, government subsidies, really exciting to see that there's this differential tax uh, for the state of Panama. Huge revenue earner is going to drive uh, decarbonisation in the shipping industry. And part of the money raised uh, from the tariffs will be allocated to environmental protection and restoration. That's a, that's a beautiful loop, like, you know, driving fossil fuels out of the economy and then using the revenues to go into environmental protection with this incredible project on uh, preserving the oceans in partnership with Costa Rica, Colombia and Ecuador. Just really inspiring to see enlightened multilateral government action, a big tear brimming up in my eye. <laughs> Um, yeah, I totally agree uh, that, you know, this this new carbon fee uh, on the Panama Canal, 
what a brilliant, eco-innovative financial instrument to be able to derive government-owned resources um, and then put them into where they ought to go, which is to the protection. And she reminded us, of course, that the watershed that is on both sides of the Panama Canal is absolutely critical to the functioning of the Panama Canal. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. you don't have that, those two watersheds protected, the canal will not be able to... Uh, to regenerate the amount of water that is necessary for the passing of these ships because 52 million gallons of fresh water are used in average by each transit of a ship through the Panama Canal. Wow. So when we, when we say, you know, that the watersheds need to regenerate the water, it's not a few drops. 52 million gallons of water for each ship that goes through the Panama Canal. And that's fresh water that is just dumped into the ocean um, and needs to be, um, as I say, needs to be regenerated. So that has to be multiplied by the average of 38 ships that use the waterway each day. Such a beautiful, crisp, clear example of how the protection of nature is actually totally in our interest and why government resources should be allocated to that. Incredible. I've been trying to do this on my calculator and I haven't got enough zeros on the screen, but it's a lot of water, right? (laughs) And what do you make of her as an individual, as a person? I mean, isn't she a force of nature? She's definitely a force of nature. Um, And one thing that uh, some listeners might be interested in is that in addition to the political leadership on environmental issues, we spoke to her exactly in the moment in which she was embroiled in a very, very difficult international standoff between Panama and Mexico, Mm. because the Mexican government had uh, proposed the appointment of Pedro Salmeron as the new Mexican ambassador to Panama, but he is surrounded by allegations of sexual harassment. And so uh, the president of Panama, Laurentino Cortizo, and the minister of foreign affairs, Erika Muines, actually did not accept, because every country has the right to either accept or not accept ambassadors uh, that are named to them. And they did not accept the naming of this uh, ambassador, Mexican ambassador to Panama. He is a very powerful politician in Mexico, and the Mexican president was furious and attacked Erika uh, for her refusal to accept his proposed ambassador. But the president of Panama backed her up, but she was right in the middle of that very difficult uh, situation. Fascinating, isn't it, how the Me Too movement has now reached international Mm -hmm. diplomatic levels. Incredible. Because of the strength uh, of people who who are willing to take a stand. Mm. An amazing story. Thank you. Very impressive. And really nice to be promoting a different Latin American country. Apart from Costa Rica. Oh, so, boy. <laughs> yeah. I, Panama. Right. I, Panama. I, 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 did, I, did, I did mention it, you know, please give me credit. I did mention it on the interview very that Panama was, yes, very, very gracious, gracious of yeah, me. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Very gracious. Okay. I think every country is wonderful. Now Top. then. All right. No, no, that was, that was fantastic. So thank you very much to Erica for joining us this week. This has been a great conversation. Um, and we are now going to go to some music as we often do, or as we always do these days. Gander Boys always. this week with their single title. Ayenda. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining us. We will be back next week and we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Hi, we are the Ganda Boys. My name is Dennis Mogaga. And I'm Danny Sawagode. Introducing our song, Tienda. Tienda sheds a light on the importance of the environment and the beauty of our land. It is chanted by a tribe that is in charge of the protection of the source of the longest river in the world. So this chant is a happy chant, but when we chant it, we remember the tribe that has kept an eye on the source of the Nile, and the chant goes. The pillow soil, the love of 
love of the land Oh, how my heart longs to be there again Like the days, the days of my dreams And the nights along by the streams I feel the magic and I feel the peace With lions, wildebeest With the eagles flying high I want to take you to Mbali I want to take you to Mbali I want to take you to Uganda I want to take you to Busoga There goes my soul There goes my mind All the beauty you could ever find Oh my motherland Oh my mother Oh my motherland Yeah my mother Oh deep in the forest across the land I hear the calling and I understand Like the song, the song of my soul How my story will You're gonna sing along with us And you're gonna do something very small And it goes Thank you! When I feel the magic and I feel the peace Of the savannas, the mountain peaks Like the great, the great days of old When the Nile overflowed Our abundance across the land And the people that stand in handy So there you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. I'm Clay, producer of the show. Welcome to the end of this week's episode, and thank you for listening. Uh, the musical guest you just heard was the Ganda Boys with their track, Tienda. Now, I know that you know that I know that the Ganda Boys, you know, their mood and enthusiasm is infectious. Uh, as always, I have links in the show notes to listen to more of their music, but if I could recommend just going straight to their YouTube and hitting play on the first video you can find, you know, interview, behind the scenes, music video, it doesn't matter. Just start watching videos. You will have so much fun. I <laughs> spent, I spent too much time, uh, watching YouTube videos and I highly recommend that you do too. They're so fun. You just kind of want to be friends. So uh, here's my pitch, Ganda Boys, if you're listening, I'm a new fan, big fan. Please can I come hang out with you? Just one day. I, I just want to ride around one day, do whatever you're doing. I'll be quiet. You know, maybe we grab lunch and a coffee, anything. <laughs> Please consider my request. So yes, Ganda Boys on YouTube. Um, You'll see more information there about the Ganda Foundation that they started, where they're raising awareness about the dire conditions in hospitals, schools, and refugee asylums in Uganda. Now, they raise money through concerts. I think they, I saw they sell coffee and other creative ways. So make sure you learn more about that. The Ganda Boys. Okay, this is the last time I'll say it. Danny, Dennis, I promise. I promise I'll be very cool, but please please let me be your friend. <laughs> Speaking of good people doing amazing things, thank you to the Panamanian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Erika Moines, for coming on the show and for her team for making the recorded conversation go smoothly. You know, when Christiana says someone is a rising star, it's time to go on social media and give that person a follow. Links to Minister Moines' social media accounts in the show notes for you. Okay, 
Okay, that's everything for today. Uh, just want to update you on our schedule for next week with the podcast. Next week is a busy one. We're going to have two episodes in your feed, one on Tuesday and then another like regular on Thursday. Tuesday's episode is about the new IPCC report coming out, and that report's coming out on Monday. So our podcast will be in your feed the following morning. And then Thursday's episode is about the crisis surrounding Ukraine and all of the implications of the world's actions in response for climate. So the best thing you can do now to make sure that you don't miss those episodes is to hit subscribe or follow. Thank you for doing that. And certainly last but not least, if you like this podcast, we are calling on our dedicated listeners to give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. We read every single review you write. And if you have feedback or thoughts on the show, you can email us at podcast at globaloptimism.com. There you go. That is it from us. Enjoy the weekend. We will see you on Tuesday. Bye.